Hi everyone, um, I'm delighted to be here today. Um, I've been in the audience at those been really interesting events and so I'm really, really pleased to be here to share some of my uh, research with you today around preconception health. Okay, so I'm going to, it's ambitious, but I'm going to try and cover the following. Um, so I'm going to try and give you a little bit of background and overview of preconception health in the recent UK context. I'm going to talk very briefly about how um, preconception health is represented in the UK news media. And then finally, um, I'm going to be um, thinking about some possible implications and maybe some unintended consequences of preconception health messaging um, in relation um, to women of reproductive, reproductive age more broadly, but also in relation to women trying to conceive. Okay. So okay, what is preconception health? So um, according to Public Health England, preconception health relates to the health behaviours, risk factors and wider determinants for women and men of reproductive age, which impacts on maternal, infant and child outcomes. So there's a focus on identifying and managing risk factors that may have an impact on maternal, infant and child outcomes, but even before a pregnancy is confirmed. So similar to the kind of historic, but also the ongoing um, focus of managing risk factors during pregnancy. Um, but here, the risk factors are being identified and um, attempting to be managed in anticipation of a possible pregnancy. So partly, I think this is in response to the Barker or fetal origins hypothesis, which you may have heard of. Um, so this is the idea that the very early interuterine environment of the fetus um, is said to shape long-term health outcomes. So because um, women don't often know that they're pregnant until a few weeks into the pregnancy, um, and because we um, also there are a, a proportion of pregnancies that are either unplanned or mistimed, um, you know, there are concerns that women may be unknowingly putting their fetus at risk by um, smoking, for example, or drinking in early pregnancy at time when they don't perhaps realise they are pregnant. Um, and so then what that means is that you know changing your behavior once you find out you're pregnant the idea is that that's too late and that women should then be changing their behaviors in advance of the pregnancy rather than reacting um, once the pregnancy is confirmed so there's a real kind of increased focus on the importance of behavior change and interventions before pregnancy and this is um, often in relation to things that are often described as modifiable risk factors. So things like things that women really have control over or positioned as having control over like their weight, for example. So it's advised that women should reduce their weight before um, becoming pregnant if they are considered to be overweight um, or stopping smoking before they become pregnant, stopping drinking caffeine, stopping drinking alcohol, for example, eating a healthy diet, those sorts of things. So those um, often are also positioned as sort of lifestyle choices as well. So one of the things I can think about and has others have thought about as well in relation to this is who are we trying to approach here in relation to preconception health? Is it that women, is it women who are trying to conceive, who are trying to, try, currently trying to plan a pregnancy? Um, or is it women of all reproductive age? And I think often because of the um, impact of this barcode, the, the fetal origins hypothesis, this concern about that very early interuterine um, environment of the fetus and managing risks in that period, what we end up with is a situation where this kind of advice and recommendations are really leveled at all women of reproductive age, regardless of whether they're intending to become pregnant or not in order to manage those risks. Okay. So in the UK, there's been an increasing focus on preconception period. Um, and this is um, not, not comprehensive, but just a kind of recent review of uh, recent updates, if you like. So in 2016, um, the UK guidance on alcohol consumption changed. So advised women who are trying to conceive to drink no alcohol. Um, 
In 2017, the NIHR published Best Beginnings, which was a review of evidence around preconception conception health um, and focused on the health before, during and after pregnancy. Um, and within that, they talked about the way in which women, by addressing women's health in the preconception period, we can give uh, children the best start in life. So really linking the health of women um, and women's behaviours to the health of the future child. In 2018, Public Health England released Making the Case for Preconception Care, and this was based on the evidence that was presented in the Best Beginnings um, Review. And they talked about the need for uh, both an individual perspective, so targeting couples who want to become pregnant in the future with um, preconception health messages. Um, but also from a population perspective, um, more broadly targeting that information at women of childbearing age. So there we go, we, there we can see a more broader application of preconception health. So it's not just about women who are necessarily planning a pregnancy, but whether women are, but all women, regardless of whether they're planning a pregnancy or not, um, are potentially implicated there. There tends to be a focus on behaviour change and individual responsibility, so women's responsibility for identifying and managing risks to the future, future pregnancy, future baby, um, as opposed to kind of wider social structural determinants of, of um, health and lifestyle, um, health and lifestyles or environmental um, impacts and so on. And also the focus tends to be on preventing risks to future babies. There is some mention of, um, you know, the benefits to the mother, benefits to women's health. But I think um, generally that the focus tends to be on preventing risk to future babies. And this is just to depict, um, I guess, the rise in focus on preconception health. So this is it's a very crude measure, I guess, but um, it's just a search for preconception health and intervention in PubMed. And as you can see over the last 10 years, it's been quite a considerable increase in the scholarship and research around kind of preconception health interventions. So I think that's quite interesting to see, you know, how, um, you know, how much of a, how, how this is a gathering pace. Okay. So I want to spend a moment just considering the case for a, fo a focus on preconception health. So as we've talked about, um, there seems to be much more of a focus on this in public health in the UK um, and, and other countries as well. However, the evidence for the effectiveness of preconception health interventions is not yet conclusive. So we need more um, robust evidence, I would argue, um, behind the benefits of preconception health interventions, if they are going to be um, you know, level that men of reproductive age in general. There are some, um, so sorry, Public Health England in their document also say that the evidence base for preconception models of care and interventions is limited. They talk about it's growing. Okay, so um, we need to make sure that that evidence is really strong. I think if we're going to start making um, giving advice to women about, you know, how they should, um, um, yeah, I guess, you know, make different lifestyle decisions um, in the preconception period. Um, there are some uh, exceptions, I think, where there's quite strong evidence. So there's quite good evidence about the impact of um, folic acid um, supplementation on reducing neural tube defects and so on. Um, and Miranda Wagner has written a fantastic book um, which she calls the preconception period the zero trimester which I think this is brilliant um, talks about how the evidence may um, indicate some individual benefits for some groups of women so for example women who maybe have a chronic health condition um, maybe may benefit from pre preconception care and counselling but that it doesn't necessarily justify a blanket approach for all women of reproductive age. And this is important because I think overstating the evidence around the risks and benefits of preconception health um, may have damaging consequences, which I'll come on to talk about a bit later. So I think around this, there's a need for more evidence and balanced um, evidence that is communicated sensitively to women um, so that they are able to make informed decisions about their 
health and lifestyle during the preconception period. Um, at the moment, I don't think there is sufficient evidence to, to, for this focus. Okay, so now I'm just going to very quickly give an overview of my findings around representations of preconception health in the media. And I think it's important to look at media representations. Antonia Lyons talks about how media representations may influence a person's perception of their degree of risk. Um, so for me, it was really important to look at how preconception health information is represented in the media and to consider the implications of those for women of reproductive age. So um, very briefly, I did a qualitative analysis of 57 articles um, published within that five-year window. Um, and these were a mixture of national newspapers, so broadsheets, but also tabloids as well. Um, and these were the three kind of um, constructions uh, that I found the most dominant constructions. So firstly, preconception health was presented in, as a means of optimising fertility. So there were a range of health and lifestyle factors, things like smoking, weight loss and so on, that were linked to either optimising fertility or having a detrimental impact on chances of conception. So the idea here was that women kind of had control um, over uh, their fertility and that by modifying their lifestyle they could shape their chances of a successful pregnancy. The second one was that preconception health determines infant health. So here um, there was a focus on the impact that poor women's poor preconception health might have on the short and long-term outcomes of future offspring. Um, so there was an emphasis on women's poor lifestyle as contributing um, to children's future health or lack thereof. Um, women were positioned as accountable for the health of ch children they're not yet, or they have not yet conceived. Um, and then importantly, this was not solely linked to health in the immediate kind of preconception period or, you know, maybe that period in which women are trying to conceive necessarily, but was also linked to women's behaviours um, many years prior to that. So sometimes we talked about the importance of talking to school girls about the importance of preconception mm -hmm. health and, you know, thinking about what behavior, their, their health behaviours now, what impact they might have on a future pregnancy. The other thing that they talked about, some of the articles talked about, was this idea of an intergenerational risk around women's preconception health. So they were not only positioned as responsible for the health of their future children, but for their future children's children and so on. Finally, the last construction was around preconception health as the point of intervention. And so this um, really constructed preconception health as an important focus for health intervention strategy. So the idea being that it's too late to change your behavior when you're pregnant, the damage is done, and so we need to bring back behaviour change to the preconception period in order to rule out any possible risks. Interestingly as well, um, preconception health interventions were also presented as a novel antidote to public health concerns such as cancer and obesity as well. So health management in the preconception period then doesn't just become an individual endeavour to improve risks or reduce risks for yourself and your future baby, but also as an important form of um, health citizenship um, and a kind of civil and moral obligation. So some conclusions then. So overall, women were positioned as in control of and responsible for their fertility, their health of future children and future generations, and of the wider population. Um, preconception health was emphasised as an increasingly important form of health citizenship for women in particular, and not just for women actively planning a pregnancy, so broad, more broadly women of, women of reproductive age. And I'll come back to the gendered nature of this um, in a moment. Okay. So I'm now going to move on to talk about some possible implications and unintended consequences of preconception health messaging. So I think the first thing I want to say is that often this is well intentioned. The intention is to try and reduce risks and to improve health outcomes for mothers and babies. And it may be valuable and there is some evidence to suggest it's valuable for some 
groups of women. However, I think it's really important to think about the implications. So um, as Ellie was kind of talking about earlier, it kind of fits with this idea that parenting is being extended further backwards. So we're now looking at women who are not yet pregnant and almost implying that they need to behave as if they are pregnant um, in anticipation of a future pregnancy. So it kind of positions women as pre-pregnant, um, which has you know, implications for women's choices and autonomy um, in the preconception period. Um, as we saw in the newspaper articles, um, and I think in the, in the policy documents as well, this tends to be gendered. The focus tends to be on women's preconception health and less so on men's preconception health. Um, and I think this reflects uh, Daniel's really helpful notion of reproductive masculinity that suggests that women, uh, men are secondary to women in reproduction and that men's reproductive systems are less vulnerable to harm and their exposure to environmental harm has less of an influence on reproductive outcomes. Some other perhaps implications in the shape of unintended consequences of this messaging. So EPAS in the past have reported that women may be ending pregnancies over fears about drinking before being aware of the pregnancy. So women finding out that they were pregnant and being really worried about the potential harm they might have done to um, the fetus in utero and, and potentially um, having an abortion and aborting an otherwise wanted pregnancy. Additionally, for those actively planning a pregnancy, um, I think um, this may increase anxiety and harm women's well-being at a time that we already know is experienced as stressful for many. Um, trying to conceive is often experienced as anxiety provoking, um, even among women who don't necessarily have a, a diagnosis of any fertility issues. So it may, all the do's and don'ts around what you should do when you're trying to conceive may make that process more um, uh, anxiety provoking. And reproductive success then becomes bound up with women's lifestyle choices. So both getting pregnant and having a healthy baby then becomes bound up with women's choices or women's lifestyle, women's health behaviours, if you like. And one of the consequences of this may be that women are positioned and they also position themselves as accountable and to blame for poor outcomes. So again, Miranda Wagner talks about how, you know, in the case of miscarriage, for example, a woman might blame herself and feel like there was something that she did wrong. Um, you know, she didn't enact the correct health behaviors and that maybe is why um, she lost the pregnancy, for example. And I would also suggest that it may mean that women delay coming forward with fertility issues, believing that the solution is within their control. So, you know, this idea that preconception health can optimise fertility, you know, health behaviours are then linked to potentially increasing or decreasing chances of a successful pregnancy. So we might see women, you know, trying to modify their lifestyle um, in order to try and improve their chances as opposed to trying to seek help for a, a, a fertility issue they may have uh, no control over. Okay, um, and this is just a, a little, little bit of data from a qualitative survey that I released in conjunction with Claire from BPAS. Um, just to show how this, some of these implications play out in terms of women's experiences of trying to conceive. So this woman says, I think it creates a sense of guilt when I do drink alcohol or have an extra coffee. I also feel it makes it hard not to constantly be thinking about pregnancy and fretting about not becoming pregnant because it means you have to scrutinise everyday actions. It's created some frustration towards my partner as I feel he's not had the sacrifices I have. And I feel at times he doesn't understand how draining the self-censorship is. So that kind of policing, that self-monitoring of your lifestyle in that preconception period for this woman, um, she feels guilty, she has a drink, she feels guilty, she has a coffee, and it's creating anxiety for her. This woman says, if I struggle to conceive, I plan to move back to vegan because I think it's healthy for my body and so I think it could boost my chances of conception. And so here we see women kind of using uh, preconception health, making modifications to their lifestyle in the hope that it will improve their chances of a successful pregnancy. 
Um, it's hard when you feel you're doing everything right and other people don't and just look at their partners to fall pregnant. There seems to be this assumption that it's easy and under our control. So here we really see, you know, women, um, you know, doing all the right things is equated with, you know, hopefully a, a successful pregnancy um, and the implications when women, you know, are doing everything right and struggling to, to become pregnant becomes quite frustrating. And finally, um, this woman says, initially, I cut down hugely on caffeine and alcohol in general. But after several years of trying and experiencing miscarriages, it became too depressing to restrict my diet and lifestyle in the hope of becoming pregnant. So this final quote shows the implications for women who have maybe tried, you know, modified everything they can around their lifestyle, restricted, um, and, you know, those... Um, those modifications have been experienced as futile, it's not resulted in a successful pregnancy and it shows how difficult those um, lifestyle modifications are to maintain in the face of, you know, um, pregnancy loss. So it kind of, I think, quite nicely um, identifies some of the barriers towards, you know, engaging in preconception health behaviours for women, you know, the context in which women are trying to conceive, for example. Um, and the difficulties um, in maintaining these really restrictive lifestyle uh, modifications um, in the face of, you know, either not getting pregnant or, um, or experiencing losses. Okay, I'm going to stop talking now. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you for having me here today. Uh, so my talk is going to focus on the implications of abstinence only drinking guidelines for women who are trying to conceive and my thoughts on an alternative approach. So specifically, I would like to challenge the wisdom of advising women to abstain from drinking alcohol before and during pregnancy and suggest that although this, uh, this advice is well intentioned, um, it actually limits our ability to tackle the broader range of alcohol-related harms and to respond to women's goals around family planning. Okay, so the headline of UK drinking guidelines is that women who are pregnant, breastfeeding, or trying to conceive should completely abstain from alcohol. And I'll refer to this throughout my talk as the abstinence only message, because unfortunately abstinence is the only approach to alcohol that these guidelines provide advice on. And this makes drinking guidelines for the so-called childbearing population very different to drinking guidelines for the general population. So for the general population, we see that the aim of guidelines is to keep the health risks um, from alcohol to a low level. And for women in the childbearing category, the aim is seemingly to, er to eradicate any risk of harm. I'm getting the breath pregnant at the moment. So, that's <laughs> fine. Uh, so for example, um, well, the chief medical officers say that the safest approach during pregnancy is for women to completely abstain from alcohol. For the general population, they advise not to drink more than 14 units per week. And if you do drink more than 14 units per week, to try and spread it um, across three days. There are two main reasons for advising abstinence. The first is concern about fetal alcohol spectrum disorders, which are a group of lifelong disabilities that result when an embryo or fetus is exposed to uh, significant levels of alcohol at significant periods in their development. The second is the belief that women need clear and simple public health messages. And this is really interesting because we don't know at what point drinking becomes significant in the development of an embryo or fetus. We do know though that every woman and every pregnancy is different and responds differently to alcohol. So clarity and simplicity in these public health guidelines come to mean that women are told not to drink any alcohol at all. And this is an application of something called the precautionary principle. So that is when public health, uh, uh, that is when there is um, some scientific uncertainty about the risks of doing something. So out of an abundance of caution, people are advised to completely avoid that activity. So preventing FASD is a very worthwhile endeavour, 
but um, I would suggest that advising women to completely abstain from alcohol is flawed for a number of reasons. And here are the, uh, some of the common criticisms that we see. Firstly, the advice doesn't reflect the evidence base. Advice to abstain from alcohol is uh, categorical advice and it implies that any alcohol is inherently harmful. But actually, there's no evidence to suggest that light drinking during pregnancy causes harm to a developing embryo or fetus. Um, another common criticism is that the advice can produce unintended consequences. Firstly, touched on this, um, women attending healthcare clinics run by EPAS talked about wanting to terminate their pregnancies for fear that they had harmed their pregnancies by inadvertently drinking in the early stages of pregnancy. And that's not surprising if we consider that categorical advice not to drink at all before and during pregnancy. And the third common criticism is that the advice is paternalistic. So whereas the rest of the population are supported to make an informed choice about their drinking, women in the childbearing category are supported only to make the right choice. Mm. Now let's look at the broader implications of abstinence only advice. Abstinence only advice is rooted in concern for the embryo or fetus. So it's not for the woman's well being or even the viability and health of her pregnancy. And I think this is a problem and it constitutes a major deviation from women's centered care. It also places an unreasonable demand on women. Uh, so colleagues at the University of Southampton have articulated this really well. The abstinence only message rides on the premise that women should avoid any unnecessary activity unless we can be sure it is completely safe during pregnancy. And there are almost no activities that we can be sure are completely safe during pregnancy. So this amounts to an unreasonable demand on women. Another one, it leaves no room for harm reduction. So clinical guidelines around illicit drug use recommend pragmatic and evidence-based interventions where people use illicit drugs, even if we believe that those illicit drugs will cause them harm. And in the same way, a harm reduction approach could support women to reduce the risk to themselves and their pregnancy should they continue to drink. And then the third part of this about why um, I believe we need to challenge abstinence-only advice and um, this is about the differences between women. So UK drinking guidelines put women who are trying to conceive in the same category as women who are already pregnant. Mm -hmm. Despite these two groups of women being in materially different situations and with probably very different concerns or priorities for their lives. So I can see to about this as well. It expects women to behave as if they are pregnant before they are pregnant and actually without any guarantee that they ever will be pregnant. It assumes that the woman's only reference point for decision making is pregnancy, um, which reduces her birth as an outlook to procreation, which is quite depressing. And it brands all alcohol consumption during this time as risky behaviour, which ignores the reasons why women drink. It ignores the reasons why many of us drink. For example, couples who are trying to conceive um, may drink for relaxation, they may drink on date nights. So I believe that um, drinking guidelines for childbearing women illustrate how narrow definitions of problems lead to narrow solutions. So in this case, public health, works, public health experts have focused almost exclusively on trying to prevent FASD. And by focusing on that, they have filtered all solutions through the question of whether they can eradicate harm to a developing embryo or fetus. And with this, only one solution has prevailed to take alcohol out of the equation entirely. So what happens if we consider the broader range of potential alcohol related harms that women can experience around conception and pregnancy, but also more generally? So on the screen here, we've got some examples of potential harms that have been observed in the literature. Most of these I should know are associated with very heavy drinking or patterns of long-term heavy drinking. Um, as well as considering this broader range of alcohol harms, what happens if we take into account the broader context of women's lives? 
So then we might arrive at, instead of the goal of trying to eradicate harm to a developing embryo or fetus, we might think about how can we reduce the range of alcohol-related harms and how can we support women's attempts to conceive this is their desire. So I submitted an essay to the Heather Trippin's Essay Prize, and one of the things I wanted to explore was whether there was a way of integrating alcohol harm reduction with family planning. The current approach of advising abstinence seemed unrealistic to me and it seemed unfair. It didn't make sense to me that we would expect women who are trying to conceive to put part of their lives on hold in the hope or on the chance that they would get pregnant. So I thought considering this very specific group, uh, the key might be around using what we know about women's menstrual cycles which many women will already use for the purposes of planning a pregnancy or avoiding a pregnancy. And I thought that this knowledge could also be useful for women who are concerned about unintentionally drinking between conception and confirmation of pregnancy. Okay, so this slide shows the current advice to abstain from alcohol mapped onto an average 28 day menstrual cycle. So drinking guidelines, current drinking guidelines, assume that the risk is too great for women to drink if they could become pregnant, because there will be a period of time between when they conceive and when they find out that they're pregnant. The assumption is that this window of time is completely unknowable, but actually it might be knowable if women are tracking their cycles each month in order to try and boost their chances of conception. So this was, this was my idea. This image demonstrates an alternative to 100% abstinence, whereby women could opt to have normal drinking days from the first day of their period to ovulation and adopt low or no drinking days, which would be up to them to define from ovulation to the first day of their next period or until they confirm that they're not pregnant. This would mean that rather than, we get this slide, rather than the 28 days out of every month not drinking, Women could have a hypothetical 13 out of 28 days as normal drinking days and 15 out of 28 as low or no drinking days. And this is something that they could do with their partner as well if both were aligned around that goal of trying to conceive. So an idea like this could help to achieve a reduction in overall alcohol consumption across the month. It could also help to lessen women's, women's anxiety that they might be drinking unaware that they are pregnant. So those were just my thoughts on a potential alternative to the abstinence-only message. I hope the idea demonstrated that innovation is possible and importantly that the abstinence-only message doesn't have to be the last word. Um, so the fact is that we don't know enough about what women in this group need or want out of alcohol advice or an alcohol intervention. I put up here um, some information about the Decipher project, which was led by Dr. Rachel Brown and Dr. Tristan. And it examined the implication of drinking guidelines for pregnant women. So they found that the lack of advanced and drinking guidelines led someone into mistrust the advice. They found that there were consequences to women complying with the abstinence message. For example, women revealing their pregnancy before they were ready by saying no to a drink in a social situation. They also found that the abstinence only message was incompatible with women's lives, particularly in UK culture where uh, social drinking is, is so normal. Um, so I think it would be fantastic to build on this key piece of work and examine the way that women who are trying to conceive make sense of and engage with drinking guidelines. And then that's about me. Thank you. Uh, I, what a great presentation. Thank you so much. Um, subjects very close to my heart. Turning, but I think what's really great about the opportunity here is to think about to a degree how we got to this place and you know I think 
Kathy's essay as well about thinking of sort of innovative solutions to take us forward and start a different conversation, I think is, is really encouraging. And I know Dr. Trippi has been absolutely thrilled at the work that was produced and, and, and the prize that was awarded in, in her name. I, I wanted to, 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 to really think actually about Kirsty's framing um, of this idea of sort of health citizenship um, and the, sort of the, the, the civic and, and moral obligation that is now put not just on, on pregnant women, uh, as we've heard, and, and not just on women trying to conceive, but potentially on, 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 on every woman who is sexually active uh, and, and the burden that that plays. And I think, you know, we've thought a lot about who, who is the centre of attention here? Is it, you know, is it, is it the fetus? Sometimes it feels like it's a fetus that doesn't even, a lot of times fetus doesn't even exist. Um, and I think a really interesting test actually is, is you know, is actually this about the, the health of the fetus or, or the woman at all, or is it actually, is, is, you know, as Kirsty has implied, something about how do we, how do we impose this idea of sort of health citizenship on women? And as I said, I think for me, a really interesting test has always been um, our attitude to fortification of flour uh, with folic acid, which is, is one of the very few, we talked earlier about the lack of evidence there is uh, for lots of, of preconception um, interventions, very little evidence at all doing any of these things actually uh, has any difference at, at an individual level or at a population level. What we do know actually is that fortifying flour uh, with folic acid genuinely reduces uh, incidence of, of neural tube defects um, such as spina bifida uh, and cephaly um, which often ends in the determination of, of much longer pregnancies or, or lifelong disabilities, very very serious consequences. Um, so you know and actually funny enough it was, it was you know British scientists who worked out that folic acid had this implication uh, and you know elsewhere in the world actually we have seen um, programs whereby folic acid has been introduced into, into diets through for, the fortification of, of, of flour. Um, and what it means actually is that in a sense, society takes responsibility for fecal health. Um, you know, everybody has this in, in, in their diets. It means that, you know, women with unwanted pregnancy, with women with unplanned pregnancies can also, you know, have this protection, they, they have it in their uh, at, at sufficient levels um, in, in, their, in their bodies when, when they can see. And yet in the UK, it's really interesting seeing uh, Kirsty's slide of you know, the, the increasing interest in preconception health, which is focused very much on alcohol, obesity, smoking to a, to a degree as well. But actually there's been very little engagement with, with this as an issue, even though we know this is something which really could improve people's health. And, and why is it why is it the case then? And I think it, it does it does make you conclude that to a degree actually this isn't about necessarily about big health. It is about surveillance and, and, and control of, of, of women to a degree, and about creating these these good moral beings that aren't overweight that aren't consuming alcohol. But there, it feels that there is something bigger at stake and that the prism of, of the, the prism of pregnancy and the hypothetical fetus is in a way this opportunity to impose some of these kind of moral, these moral health obligations um, on, on women, often in the absence of, you know, of, of any good evidence um, at all, and in the knowledge as well of some of the consequences um, for, for, for women of, of, of imposing these kind of instructions of, of making women themselves feel this, this burden of responsibility um, for, for, for outcomes uh, among their offspring that, you know, as we know, they often have no control over whatsoever. And I do, Ellie sent the other day a, um, uh, uh, a poster that's, uh, I think it is from the dry, dry master. Um, so it's, um, uh, it's, it's a 
against drinking in pregnancy, and it's a, and it's a poster that everyone is supposed to be or you know, your shop owner or your whatever engagement you have with with women. Uh, the, the idea is that you know it is now you, you you should feel a sort of obligation to inform women uh, pregnant women uh, if you're a hairdresser and you know. And, um, there should be a poster in, 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 your, in your window uh, explaining to her the, the, the dangers of, of alcohol consumption. Um, now, you know, even, even <laughs> parking that for, 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 for a moment, I think what's interesting is that it, this, this sense that at one level society, it has a, you know, this is a sort of social obligation on, you know, on people who aren't pregnant to spread the word. Of, of the dangers of, 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 of drinking alcohol in pregnancy to, 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 to pregnant women. And so at, at one level, it's this kind of, that, that we do think society has an obligation and that's, you know, and in a sense, that's why the Duchess of Cambridge is now so lauded as, as raising awareness, uh, 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 you know, within society of, of, of these kind of, of dangers. And yet I come back to my hobby horse, the Polic Acid Falsification. And yet, as a society, we aren't prepared to actually take any of that responsibility on ourselves for improving long-term outcomes. The burden falls squarely onto that individual woman who needs to be surveyed and monitored and made into this good health citizen. Um, so yes, I think, I, I, I think there's something about how do we understand how we have got to this situation and, 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 and how do we start unpicking it and you know what I love about Natalie's work is that you know so when I you know when I first read Natalie's essay I thought oh my god I just never it's almost like we've just never been able to have this kind of conversation like actually how could we how could we do this differently how could we take a, a harm reduction approach and how do we start having different conversations um, about how to take this forward because I think you know as, as Kirsty says a, a lot of this starts with very good very good intentions indeed and we all want good outcomes for, for mothers and, and, and their babies and yet a lot of the time it doesn't feel that that's what we end up with and in fact we're causing more harm than, than good in the process. Thank you. Um, so yes, so thank you, and I'd echo what Claire said. So um, it's really, really important that we're having these conversations, and um, it's interesting for me because I, I've got um, a number of hats. So I have a policy hat, I have a public health hat, and I have a clinical hat. And trying to pull all these things together and say, so, so what really are the implications of this for us? And having sociological perspective to that is um, is probably the most important thing that we need to do. So I um, I really uh, like the way that you've sort of captured the, the binary messaging of this. It's a sort of, it's either this or nothing. Mm -hmm. And, you know, some of the nuance that you've really surfaced. So I think, you know, Natalie, the, the idea of abstinence only versus, you know, there, there is something that's in the middle, this is around harm reduction is really, really important. Um, and so I do think sort of what I'm kind of left with in terms of, you know, what, what do you actually do when you're, and I really want to speak a little bit from a clinical perspective, because what do you do with some of this? You know, we know that actually the role of medicine is very much with the individual, you know, with the person in front of you um, and the power of being medical uh, with the power to talk in terms of should, and must and and those kind of messages are really really prevalent so how can we sort of nuance them a bit better without throwing the baby out with the bathwater so I, I kind of think excuse the pun for that but um, <laughs> um I, I do think you know it's really important to think you know who is the messaging at you know who are the people who could be supported better to achieve the outcomes they want to achieve without the sense of kind of this is the way that you should or shouldn't behave for the benefits of the fetus that probably doesn't even exist at this point. So I and I suppose some of the examples that I was, you know, when I was trying to think, well, you know, well actually where where do we add value in terms of sort of messaging? Um, and certainly sort of thinking about um, some of the issues around, and I think one of you mentioned it about women with sort of long-term conditions and sometimes there's an opportunity before thinking about pregnancy maybe to optimise and make sure that um, they feel most in control of their condition 
um, uh, if they want to go ahead and do that. But I think there's another sort of slightly sinister messaging that comes out of this as well, which is around the concept of um, all unplanned pregnancies equals bad. So I think that there's this move towards saying let's abolish ambivalence and actually, I'm sure, you know, we all know that ambivalence plays a really important role. You know, many women go forward with pregnancy and are ambivalent. Um, and the concept that ambivalence or unplanned equals bad and poor outcomes. So I think that you're sort of pulling those messages out really effectively. Um, and again, you know, thinking, you know, well, how does this link with the, the kind of more sort of <laughs> person in front of you narrative and what, what you know, preventing, you know, the, the promotion of longer acting methods of contraception, for example, is really key to that ambivalence uh, message being pushed, which is like, you know, do not get pregnant unless you absolutely want to get pregnant. Well, then, you know, we get into the conflicts again of what, what do we do, you know, longer acting methods are, are kind of useful methods, you know, for some people. Um, so how do we support women to have those kind of choices if they want to have a longer acting method, that's fine, and if they don't, that's also fine. And so there's this a sort of push towards let's increase long acting methods of contraception um, and make sure that we increase the rates, but actually of course what we want to do is increase the choices. So, and those, the ways of counting those things, which is what we love to do, is so much caught up in um, stopping women having unplanned pregnancies rather than thinking about do they actually have all the facilities available to them if they want them. So sometimes the, the, the thing you end up counting might have both sort of outcomes, but I just think we need to be really careful um, with that. Um, I wanted to raise another sort of thing about inequalities because I think um, one of the things I'm really seeing in my practice is that uh, there is a shifting narrative. So I think that women are increasingly pushing back and saying, actually, we want to have a discussion here. We don't want to be told what's right and what's not. I'm seeing it particularly in the sort of wider aspects of my reproductive health sort of work, which is things like um, particularly notable at the moment around um, periods and managing periods with hormonal methods and lots of women saying, I, I don't want to use hormones and it really doesn't matter as a medical profession whether we think hormones are good or hormones are not good you know I think there's a real kind of sense of sort of control um, and heavy periods as well as sort of contraception as well as conception these are all bound up together in terms of kind of reproductive autonomy I was just thinking I saw the other day I saw a 24 year old woman and I found her really interesting. She um, so she had terrible, terrible heavy periods, and she'd been for investigations at the hospital, and she'd had a, what's called a hysteroscopy, where you have a telescope put into the womb. She'd been told not, absolutely nothing wrong with her, but of course she couldn't go out because she had such terrible, terrible <laughs> periods, and it was ruining her life. And she also felt really strongly that she didn't want to use hormones, and she'd been advised to use a hormonal containing uh, coil, an IUS. Um, which arguably could have been a good treatment for her and she was very adamant that she didn't want to use that method and so it was a bit of a sort of let's wash our hands with you you know that you know you don't want this then off you go you know you, you're you're making a bad decision and and then through her GP also got that same message and somehow you know I I had the luxury I have half an hour appointments I'm very very lucky so um, so we had a conversation together and I think one of the things we really need to do um, as medics is to be honest about the limitations of medicine and you know it isn't reproductive health is a um, you know it's not an illness um, however we've brought a very biomedical approach to that so we you know telling people bringing those <laughs> those biomedical solutions to things that aren't illness um, is inherently really really tricky and so we had a conversation together about you know and I'm like well you know sounds awful your periods you know you can't go out terrible um we have a couple of things that we can help you with which you know there isn't any underlying kind of disease here um one of those is hormones because this is how they work this is what it might do one of these are treatments that you can take during your period and the other is all the things that you're already doing, which is trying to use non-medical approaches, complementary approaches, you know, that's all I have, you know, 
And so she went away and said, well, I, I think I might have an IUS. And, and so I, I kind of think, you know, and I, I don't feel all smug about that and think like, oh, you didn't do a good job. I didn't particularly, but all I'm saying is I think framing the kind of discussion around these are, these are just things that you could do. What do you want to do? So sort of being a sort of information giver rather than a judge mm -hmm. um, of whether something's good or, or not good. Um, and I worry about that, though, because I think that, you know, again, it marginalises the people who are already marginalised because getting to that point, that woman needed to, one, force her way into three different, to see three different professionals articulate her needs and get her needs met. And of course, we know that not everybody has that opportunity. So how do we make sure that what we give is proportionate to people's needs rather than um, just a kind of one size fits all and that in the current climate obviously that's really really difficult so again no answers but a, but a question um, and then the last thing I wanted to say I guess which is linked to that is that you know um, I was a bit nervous about having to talk to a bunch of sociologists because uh, <laughs> my daughter's just doing her sociology A level and uh, had a crash course on Sunday. And I was like, oh, yeah, this is so relevant to actually what we're going to be talking about today. And I have to say, sociology is really um, fascinating. <laughs> and it just, we were talking about the sort of scientific paradigm and the idea that, you know, as medics, we are brought up with kind of biology and you're talking to people mostly who's who like to find solutions and who like to think about, you know, condition, treatment, off you go. And I think there's something about educating, sociologists educating uh, medics in terms of how do we get better at a sort of risk communication um, and shared decision making. And we do talk about it a little bit, so it's happening a little bit in general practice that probably further forward than, than specialists are, but you know, how do we make sure that we equip? So when we talk about individual behavior change, I think we should be talking about behavior change for the uh, people who are meeting out the advice rather than the people who are there. Mm -hmm. And so I think there is something to be said for sort of thinking about how do we get these messages out so that, um, you know, we can use, yes, use evidence, really, really important, but, but make sure that that evidence is contested and make sure that it's translated into messaging that is empowering rather than limiting. So I would say thank you so much to both of you. I've really, really enjoyed this, really made me think both of your presentations. I've been very much involved in this zero trimester, I love that term, um, concept of preconception and it is really you know, sometimes I sort of go forward and I'm just kind of like, yeah, 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 do this, take that. And, and actually it's really made me go back to that and really reflect about what that's trying to achieve. And I think probably that's the intention of your papers. So um, <laughs> I would say that that's a message that I'm going to be um, taking on with me. So, um, you know, thank you so much for inviting me and your work is great. So, thank you. Thank you. Got just over 20 minutes or so. Um, so you can raise anything they want to, really. Yeah. They are two great thoughts and really interesting responses. I'd, I'd like to frame this as a question because I was also really struck by what you said about health citizenship. So just thinking about it over the last like, half an hour or whatever. Um, because the idea of you know, as a citizen, you have rights and you have responsibilities, and also as a, as a citizen in many contexts, you have access to things that non-citizens don't. Mm -hmm. And you picked up some sort of possible unintended consequences um, with the sort of the preconception health messaging around um, you know, like things that are fault or um, trying to manage things themselves. I wondered if you thought at all about the um, the risk of possible gatekeeping um, by health services, right? and there's a sort of tension between health services as you described as that one-on-one -on -one relationship, but also health services as something that's commissioned at a population level. And you you know we see gatekeeping to lots of different things through sort of BMI and, and uh, a weight lens. And I just wanted to put something new. 
in your research in this space? Yeah, no, it was it hasn't actually, and you've made a really interesting point. Yeah, I think in the articles it was really about locating almost like, and others have talked about this, but like the solution to obesity is being, you know, resting with the woman and lying, you know, within the womb, basically. Um, and so, yeah, so in, in the data, they were really positioned as, you know, in order, in order to um, address obesity at a kind of public health level, you know, this might be a new way of, you know, everything else we've done hasn't worked. This might be a new way of combating obesity um, by, you know, getting women to think about, um, you know, uh, changing their behaviour before they get pregnant. Um, so yeah, I suppose, yeah, because that was the way it was framed in the data, but yeah, I think that's a really um, interesting um, point, thank you, and what, yeah, definitely one worth thinking about. I just, I wonder, I know everyone said all of this stuff comes from a place of good intent. I'm not so sure <laughs> I agree with that, because there's a long history, going all the way back to Aristotle, of believing women's bodies are inferior and as a consequence women are inferior, they can't be trusted, you know, the body is, is weak and pathetic and that's why she's got all these problems. And then on top of it, she then gets to control what happens to this fetus. And, you know, the poor man, he doesn't have that control. I just, I'm not convinced. It's not really a question. But, yeah, you know. so I think it's, it's, it's all of it. I think you're, I think you're absolutely right with being generous and you say it always does. I think actually obesity is, is, a, is a really good case in point because clearly there are, there are particular risks to a, a, a woman, you know, obstetric risks of being very overweight when, when pregnant and, and to a degree you know there is you know there is clearly you know medicine wants to where it can limit those 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 risks and, and support women and I think but I think that's where it then intertwines with this 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 greater sort of moral imperative to police women's bodies and then to you know to come back to what Rebecca was saying as well about you know the kind of the, the sort of public health you know imperative that rather than you know, is it you know are we looking at a you know a society-wide campaign to improve, improve people's access to healthier foods you know and to and to support people at large if they want to, to lose weight no we are we are focusing very squarely on on that individual woman and her, you know, her kind of moral failings of, 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 of being overweight and pregnant. And, and then also, you know, when we go back to the Barker theory, not just making her responsible for this, for the pregnancy she's, a, you know, she's either about to have or, or is in, but, but, you know, then somehow ending up with a theory whereby this individual woman is, is somehow pre-programming not just her own fetus to a lifetime of obesity, but, but, but the ones that, that follow, um, you know, and I, I mean, I must say, you know, at a practical level, the, unfortunately, Re Re Rebecca Blaylock's not here today to, to talk about the risk project, she was, she was going to do that, but, you know, I, having looked at the comments within that, I, I would say some of the most heartbreaking ones we came across were the, the women who had gone into it to, to pregnancy obese, and to come back to your point about is it all good intentions, you know, what has started probably out with good intentions but how can we make pregnancy safer for these women ended up with these women actually feeling that they had failed not just themselves but the, the baby they had not even yet to have before they had even started and many of these women if you are obese it's very very unlikely you are going to get to a normal bmi before you become pregnant but some of these women have lost a huge amount of weight in order to get pregnant but that was not recognized because they were still they were still overweight so they were still bad mothers um and you know and their experience was abominable they you know they there were interviewees who said in that you know i i we, me and my husband didn't even put a cot up because we were so convinced we wouldn't be taking it like this at home also in a case that the road to hell is paved with good intentions mm -hmm. um i mean it's perfectly arguable that even if the intentions of those who, who see the, the world in the way that is now so so dominant, even if they are good, um, that kind of doesn't really matter <laughs> um, in terms of, of, of where it, it might, might end up. And I think that, um, I mean, when you do have a situation where 
um, a master narrative has become so strong, which says you and all of us, and therefore what happens to society, is ultimately explained by what happened when you're in the womb or before. Mm -hmm. And the points that you make, Kirsty, about the way this is now expanded to an explanation which um, projects far into the future of um, generations yet to come, uh, whether the intentions of those who argue this are, are good, bad or indifferent, um, that's a pretty remarkable way to see people, what we are, what we can become, our future um, and, and how we understand it. Um, you know, and there's the, the long literature, which I'm very interested in and in, in persuaded by around all of this, does indeed trace this, um, what literature calls infant determinism. Um, the idea that, that something has decides what we are um, in some way, way before we have the capacity to decide it for ourselves. Um, is, is, is a very strong, strong predilection now. And I think it can, you know, it has very negative implications, I think, for, for all of us. I think it is also worth considering its implications for children. Because if you keep saying to kids, <coughs> the reason why you're the way you are is because of what your mum did. Mm. Well, that's, that's not nothing, is it? Mm. That's quite something to say to children in terms of how, how they think about themselves, what they can become, never mind their relationships with their mothers. Mm. Ella. Um, yeah, it's just that it's, you know, the thing that's so dispiriting about the way in which uh, pregnant women and women who are trying to get pregnant are treated is that pretty much from the get-go, it's like you're intent on doing something wrong mm -hmm. and you have to be swayed back to the right path. You know, the most, I mean, the poster being, that you're talking about being an incredible example about that, which and the funny thing being that at the same time, I don't know if people have noticed, there's a real... Uh, not an official campaign, but I've seen so much stuff about um, pregnant women's rights and people saying, you know, hands off my bum. Isn't it terrible that people come up and put their hands on your bum? And that's really awful, but, you know, someone sniffing your coffee when you go into the hairdresser to check if it's Irish or not, it's, it's meant to be okay. You know, that's the right kind of um, cynicism, but uh, mm -hmm. it's, so it's, it's all very warped. And I was just thinking about, you know, whether or not the, the, the sort of solution that Natalie talked about, one of the, you know, the, the idea that you would have um, sort of demystifying, particularly, you know, conception and how you get pregnant or the time frame in which you might be more likely to get pregnant and being a powerful way of enabling women more choice, which is, you know, it's an incredibly attractive thing. But it highlights the way in which so much of, of, of um, women's sense of themselves and their reproductive health is mystified and absolutist so at the same time as even from you know in terms of like sexual education at school and um, it, like, it wasn't until i re realized that i had infertility problems that i realized there was only a very small window in a month where i could get pregnant feasibly just you know and you know speaking to friends nobody knows that and speaking to you know a retired midwife you realize the generational difference between women who relied on the counting method um, uh, you know, before the innovations that we have today, knew about that. And, you know, the great thing is that we can just pop a pill these days and be relatively sure that we're covered. But it also means that lots of young women have no idea. So, so you know, to take a, just a silly example, it's a bit, it's, you know, I'm really glad you mentioned this in your talk because it's very difficult in the public realm, whether it's on Twitter or elsewhere, to sort of defend the idea that a pregnant woman or, or you know, even less controversial, a woman you know, who's 20 and is at university might like to have a drink because drinking is so problematized for various different reasons today. But, um, you know, early in my pregnancy, I, uh, you know, if, if anyone else here has been suffering terribly from hay fever this year, I was cramming pills, trying to, as I always do, trying to fix it, ordered a new prescription of my GP and got this horrendous phone call telling me that, you know, immediately stop now or, you know, you're going to miscarry. And so then spent <coughs> that my baby was going to be born with four ears or not be born at all. Until then, a very nice doctor rang me and said, look, the thing is, it's not that it causes miscarriage. It's just that there isn't any reliable evidence because 
funny enough, pregnant women who don't go into trials. And then you start to think, okay, all right. And, it, and it was that information was empowering. Mm -hmm. But just my question was that, you know, I don't necessarily want to get into a situation in which you're telling, you know, the, the workaround is really attractive and all of that. And more choice is really attractive. But I also just have this gut feeling that says, Women in their late teens and in their early twenties just don't shouldn't be thinking about this at all unless they unless they want to have children, um, and that like you know I don't need to be counting for when I have a drink or mm. worrying about any just leave me alone basically which is the other side of me that thinks mm. if anyone told me any of this when I was young I would have said oh, I'll get off my back and there's and where's that kind of balance as well? It's interesting that whole question as well about how any of this might make young women particularly perceive the whole prospect of motherhood mm. and whether any of this is at all at play in, in what's going on with birth rates is one mm -hmm. issue that we might raise. Well, complete, I mean, thinking about what Sue said about, you know, that we, 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 we compartmentalise pregnancy into sort of, you know, planned and wanted um, or unplanned and, and unwanted and, and actually, you know, you've this huge grey area of, of, of ambivalence, which I think, if anything, the current discussion almost sort of plays into, like, why would you... You know, the, the idea now to actively plan a pregnancy with all this as, as your as your backdrop and, and all these you know social health obligations that I think you know women feel they shoulder the burden for you think of anything it's not surprising that there is more ambivalence and see what happens if anything with that pregnancy. Um, yeah so I, so I was thinking about the broader culture as well and um I think, I mean, it's particularly noticeable in, in alcohol, but I think it has a broader resonance. It's this idea about the shift in sort of moral regulation movement. So the first abstinence campaigners were very much talking about the vice, right? So drinking alcohol was a vice. Um, and, the, and that we've seen a shift in terminology from vice to sin to risk, right? Mm -hmm. and, and that's where the trajectory yeah. goes. And, and there's been quite a lot written about this. Um, so so the, the, the way that um, you want to morally control people now is, is through talking about risk. And I was also thinking about, um, and really, I really like your, your graph, I thought that was really interesting. Because the other thing I thought about, which was sort of a graph that might go the other way, was about um, the acceptance, or widening the acceptance, of sex outside marriage, for example, and the freedom that women have to have sexual life divorced from reproduction mm -hmm. and in a way that this is putting sort of moral controls back into women's mm -hmm. sexual lives by you know building this idea about risk around a potential pregnancy and, and how that maps onto this idea about you know sort of it used to be a sin and now we can talk about risk and how that framework mm -hmm. seems to sort of like really map on mm -hmm. um because you know the you know as you know you know, those, I mean, women are, women are bearers of the collective, right? There is no furtherance of a nation or a community or family unless people have children. And that was one of the reasons why there's so much control around reproduction. Mm -hmm. And it seems to me that there might be something in the fact that if you can't control when they're having sex, let's shift the, the balance of moral regulation around risk in not just pregnancy, but pre-pregnancy period to almost put back some of the controls that have been lost. Um, on that, one of the, the things that I wanted to raise and um, I'd be interested in what, what you thought about this Sue. So, um, you know, recently there's been um, a whole new policy framework published in England about FASD, the documents from, from NICE and from the um, DHSC and from Public Health England as well. Um, and one of the things that I think is a real step change from the situation that, that, that we used to have, which was basically the communication of abstinence advice to women, is to a framework which is much more um, active in what it asks of healthcare providers and the way they then work within maternity services, but interestingly also within reproductive health services. So one of the things that I find very striking within this whole framework is the way that reproductive health services have been brought into um, the domain of um, prevention of um, alcohol-affected pregnancies, and specifically what's argued in, in these policy documents 
is that women who are at risk of an AEP um, should be advised to use LARP. So that basically the idea is, is that you switch off women's reproductive capacity until they're at a point where they can be abstinent, um, which is a, a pretty, pretty, well, unless I'm missing something, that's quite a, a step change in the way we might think about um, the provision of, of contraception um, and what larks are there for. Um, anyway, um, which kind of speaks to your point. Jenny and Charlie, yeah. yeah. Yeah, thanks for some really great presentations. I mean, I've just been, um, I'm perpetually interested in this sort of hierarchical relationship between the biological and the ideal in when it comes to discussions about pregnancy now. But, and I thought the presentations really, really brought it out that um, on one level, you have discussions about pregnant women in relation to their you know, food, drink, whatever substances that, that sees what's going on as entirely biological. You know, you know, just like an incubator, you know, and that's what matters. And you know, women's social life being doesn't really figure. And then on the other hand, you've got also the thing that you said, Kirsty, about that, that notion that if you do the right thing, you will become pregnant, as though somehow there isn't a, a biological mechanism there at all. You know, it's just a reward for behaving in a particular kind of way. And, you know, and I think it does sort of speak to this, this kind of strange thing that um, planned pregnancy has become. You know that it used to be not having children when you didn't want them whereas now the, the notion is very much that you you plan for them mm. actively and, and you kind of delay defer behave yourself and everything else until that point where you can take the plunge where and then i you know i share ellie's uh, <laughs> worry then in terms of what this does for younger women and their ideas about becoming okay i mean i i rarely meet a young woman who thinks of having kids with anything other than horror because it's like <laughs> oh my god you, know, you have to do this and this and this and this and this and you know i mean presumably it's more mediated than that as life goes on and, and everything else but i think there is a sort of it, it is a strange disconnect isn't it that inability to see the biological and the sort of social or individual as kind of as, as one thing at the moment mm -hmm. what maybe just take uh, there's three here and then we'll take the final comments from the, the front Johnny. Yeah, it's just a really quick bit of fact that Kirsty said about the sort of gender aspect of it and how men are sort of seemingly written out of this. Um, and actually, I don't know that that's the case. It seems to me there is more about you know, men sort of being invested in this process, particularly if you're thinking about fertility in particular and like you know, creating optimum sperm and this sort of thing, which is actually interesting given what how much one can change sperm relative to how much one can change eggs, right? Yeah. But also, I guess I would also feel kind of uncomfortable about them being drawn into this whole way of being in that sort of mm. sense of like self-censorship and anxiety about you know so um, yeah it's just that sort of double-edged sword thing mm. <laughs> yeah thank you um so of course we've what you've said actually we know that um, the birth rates in the same countries are actually declining and it's hypothesized that people do increase in pepper parenting laws so you have one child that they have to go to tutoring and not only that and that kind of intensive parenting can also be kind of further and further back as people in the market, which is quite funny. But also, that seems to me, I have a bit of this thing that there's a very class specific view of parenting. And I think the interesting about that LARP thing is that I'm concerned about the LARP points that I'm going to say. I'm interested on. Um, Youth and more active diverse sort of perspectives, and actually, it's really fast actually mm -hmm. often very space where women being pressured intensively into being pregnant because they're seen to be not fertile, mm -hmm. not going to be pregnant in the eyes of the this because, uh, on the one hand, it's a huge amount of pressure and where women kind of voluntarily enter into the other hand, that's then giving that whole other set of women who don't care are being forced into. I'm just wondering about the 
and so I was, I was just sort of curious about this idea of control. Don't have a huge amount of control. And what is our involvement? And particularly around this part of the on this area. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Take some last comments then before we have a break. Or should we go this way? Yeah, and uh, sort of such interesting points, and I think there's a really sort of um interesting narrative coming out around control and women who maybe have the least of all. Um, I'm interested, Ellie, in your point about the, um, you know, the very, very sort of draconian use of longer acting methods in terms of FASD, but we're also seeing that in women who've had removals into care, you know, the, the kind of the use of LARC. Um, we see it in, I, I think someone's going to talk about Valproate later on, but we've seen it in, around the kind of issue of Valproate. So I think there's a very sort of um, sinister narrative around these very, very risky women who sort of mustn't be pregnant, which is really sort of worrying. And then we see more of a spectrum. And it's interesting if you look at the data around um, sexual health clinics and you look at the um, proportion of women who take up LARCs, um, comparing different socio-demographic groups and those, the women in group five are more likely to take it up than the women in group one. And I think it's fascinating about when we think about why that might be and how that messaging might be put across to, to those women in the clinic. So, um, so many sort of rich kind of aspects to this that are all kind of uh, knitting together, but, but really interesting discussions. Thank you. Yes, I, I suppose, you know, one of the things that I think is increasingly the, the case that, that sort of like responsible, the, the, the way, particularly early abortion, I guess, sits within this, this, this framework is that, you know, early abortion is to, to a degree now seen as, a, you know, a very responsible choice um, for, you know, for, for a woman who hasn't prepared her body and, and life to, to, to have a, to have a baby. And, you know, and actually the, the more morally charged decision is perhaps to continue a, a pregnancy when you're, you've got a very high BMI or you're not prepared to, to, to you know, to, to, to cut down on, you know, whatever vice or risk or <laughs> sin <laughs> you're, 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 you're engaged with. And I think, it, yes, it, it's, it's kind of, some of the assumptions now about motherhood are perhaps, you know, turning on their head. Sort of, you know, we've, we've traditionally more ethically charged aspects of, of pregnancy. Mm. Yes, I certainly find in teaching, sorry, <laughs> find in teaching, abortion is less controversial than women drinking when they're pregnant. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. Yeah. Um, yes. Um, so I think one of the things I'm going to uh, go away and think some more about is how the way that ideologies are shaping the language even, even we're using so your comment about how, how we'd all um, said that um, advice around the preconception period and pregnancy was well-intentioned. That's mm -hmm. the kind of thing. I mean, um, it's important to engage with those arguments at face value. And yes, it is a good thing to try and prevent something like FASD, but they're not always well-intentioned. And there's also overlaps um, between efforts to prevent FASD and efforts to reduce women's reproductive rights mm -hmm. so that's important to acknowledge uh, another thing was um really you used the term aep alcohol exposed pregnancy yes. and i think um because, no, no, <laughs> no because that is a term um that is now commonly used yeah. in <laughs> clinical guidelines mm -hmm. but we need to challenge that kind of terminology Definitely. because as i was talking about um it's it kind of operationalizes this idea that any alcohol is a risk to a pregnancy. Yeah. So an alcohol exposed pregnancy, we're not using it to mean that a woman has been drinking very heavily throughout her pregnancy. It could mean that over lunch, I had a glass of wine and I've exposed my pregnancy to alcohol. Yeah. So, yeah. Mm -hmm.
Yeah, thank you for the comments. Really interesting. Yeah, it's really interesting to actually reflect on where this notion of control comes from around, you know, reproduction. And, and I think in relation to this, it potentially comes from, you know, this idea about you can be a risk manager, you know, so Joan Wolfe talked about the idea of, you know, total motherhood as a kind of development from intensive motherhood, this idea that as part of that, you're responsible for managing all these risks. And if you if it's said that you can manage these risks, you know, to, you know, reduce caffeine, that reduces your risk of miscarriage and so on. I think it kind of gives you, um, I think it's like a step then from actually saying, well, actually, then I do have some control. If I cut out this caffeine, then I have some control over, you know, maybe the the success of this particular pregnancy, for example. So I wonder if that maybe that um, is where some of that comes from. Um, and yeah, just one other thing that I've just been reflecting on is, yeah, we're talking about are these arguments well-intentioned? And for me, again, it kind of taps in this, into this idea about good mothers, you know, or good mothers and um, almost like capitalizing on the guilt you know, maternal guilt, um, you know, if we tell women that, you know, um, they could be risking, you know, you know, a lot of these arguments are directed about the risks to the baby, not the benefits for women's health, you know, in and of themselves. So um, it's maybe assumed that that won't work. You know, if we tell women that this is healthy for them, it's not going to work. So we need to make them feel guilty. Let's tell them, <laughs> that's maybe a really cynical reading, but let's tell them about the risks to the to the, the to potential fetus. And maybe that will work. Maybe that will make them stand up and listen. So maybe kind of play, you know, capitalizing in a way on that kind of notion of maternity guilt and responsibility. Mm. All right, thank you everybody. So we've got a break. I'm hoping